Welcome once again to the Soccer OG World Cup Daily. This is me, Max Bretos. Hope you're enjoying the competition. We are getting close to wrapping up our first week. I hope you're getting your rest, watching enough games. We're having a really good time here and we have some big games to break down and some storylines to develop. As always, a reminder to let you know the Soccer OG World Cup Daily can be found where all podcasts are available in audio form. You can see the video edition right here in my fine fashion prowess on my YouTube under my name, Max Bretos. We are all over it on social media. They are the handles for TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, which we're here right now. Few things to uh, discuss here. We are going, uh, obviously the smoke is cleared after USA England, but we will discuss Gio Reyna here in a moment and uh, the role that he is gonna be playing for the US team. Some news breaking about him. We'll let you know exactly what's been going on. Then we will be joined by Eric Braden, uh, the most famous soap opera actor star in the world, the young and the restless. I don't wanna say soap opera because he's had an accomplished career. I was slipping through the channels. I saw one of the old 1960s Planet of the Apes movies. Dated reference. I know he was in that. So uh, he loves his sport. He was a great player in the 70s in Los Angeles, winning some U.S. Open Cups. We'll talk about the tournament. We'll talk about his beloved Germany, which we will also preview that game here in a moment. But let us begin by uh, starting with the games that we saw on Saturday. It began bright and early. 2 a.m. Pacific time, Tunisia and Australia. And Australia getting the victory, one settle, a 23rd minute goal from Mitch Duke. I don't know how Australia is doing it. You look at that roster and you're like, where is it? Where's the talent? I don't know. I mean, these are guys playing in lower divisions in not really highly regarded leagues, playing in the domestic A-League, which pales in comparison to some of the other leagues in the exterior outside of Europe. A lot of guys a little bit old in the tooth, but they have an incredible spirit and they are uncompromising. And if you push them, they will push you back. And Australia, who uh, after Tunisia got a really nice tie against Denmark, we figured it was curtains for them. And now they, uh, now we have to see if uh, Tunisia can salvage this because Australia just need a point in their final game to classify for the round of 16. That's incredible to say. But I'm sure Tunisia and Australia, when they saw this group, looked at each other and said, we can beat them. And if we can beat them, we have a shot. Because Denmark dropped points against Tunisia, Australia is in really good shape. Really nice moment. Mitch Duke, when he scored the goal, it was a, it was a weird goal. Uh, cross was deflected. It just sprung in the air and he headed it home. He made like the J sign. I don't know if I'm doing it correctly. It was like a J sign, but it was for his son, Jackson, in the crowd, and the camera caught him doing it. It was a wonderful, tender moment. So uh, the Australians who love their sport, there was images from Melbourne where the place went absolutely bonkers. Thousands of fans. And you wonder with that kind of rabid support, why can't they get, they need some investment there. You know, Australia loves their sports, but they have their own sports. They have Australian rules. They have a rugby union, they have rugby league, they have cricket, and soccer, we keep hearing, is going to be the number one sport. Uh, they're qualifying for World Cups. They're one of six Asian teams to be in here, but we've got to see if they can figure it out a little bit. Uh, but World Cup success certainly allows that. Great atmosphere. We mentioned yesterday about all the expat Tunisians who live in Qatar, who are working there. So they filled the stadium. So if you heard that game, you could hear it was raucous. And we like that. Tunisia, when they fell down, <coughs> fell behind. Uh, not a good omen because in the previous 30 games when they trailed, they have uh, they had not won in any of them. 30 games. Some good chances for Tunisia. Yusuf Ensakni, Isam Jebali, but they couldn't convert. Tunisia's kicking themselves. Missed opportunity. Australia now awaits to see if they can have that effort against Denmark. Again, they just need a tie. Next up, we got to see Saudi Arabia again. The Saudis. We got to see Hervé Renard. That's always good. And his wonderfully pressed, heavy starch white shirt. He goes to the laundromat and I was listening to the broadcast and they said he was a cleaner's business. Just an incredible path for this guy. And his shirts are just like, they go, would you like some starch in your shirt? He goes, yeah, heavy starch. Because it's like, it looks good. But you know, when you wear a shirt with too much starch on it, it's like a little itchy. 
We're not talking about dry cleaning though. We're talking about uh, Poland, who are a favorite coming in here. Saudi Arabia, you can't underestimate this team. They, uh, they took it to the polls. They were the better of the teams. They had 64% possessions, outshot uh, this Poland team 16 to nine. When we came in, remember the high press against Argentina, we were under the thought that Saudis were, were gonna be very cautious. It hasn't been the case. They have been uh, enterprising and attack-minded. Unlucky not to get the goal. Piotr Zielinski scored somewhat against the run of play in the 39th minute. Then, um, by the way, another great moment for a Napoli player, which has become a nice story. And then Robert Lewandowski, well, we should say there was a penalty. Wojciech Szczesny with a beautiful sprawl to deny the Saudis and on two occasions. It was a double save. That uh, obviously was, that's got to be tough. Uh, when you work so hard, you don't get it. Horrible mistake later in the second half, which gifted Robert Lewandowski his first World Cup goal. Good for him. It was wonderful to see all the Polish players gather around him. They know how important it was for him. And by the way, the way this group is going, that goal could loom large when it comes to goal differential. We'll talk about Argentina and Mexico here in a moment. Uh, it's going to be a real war at the end with, with Argentina. Mexico still in it. Poland in first place. Have not been that impressive. I mean, I, I, I can't believe it. They're four points here and they haven't really played, but you know, they haven't been a very good tournament team, but here they are and they can't, they, they can't let this out of their hands. So uh, they'll finish up next Wednesday against Argentina and we'll see uh, what Argentina shows up, but they're obviously feeling, playing a little better after what we happened here. And don't give up on the Saudis. They have three points in the bank. And they're going to take a, a Mexico team that just doesn't have fangs right now. So we'll, we'll see if they're able to uh, somehow make the round of 16. I wouldn't bet against them. Next up, France, Denmark, Kylian Mbappe. He is the best player in this tournament. He had two goals. He has three now. He also been involved in a couple other of the overall six goals the French have scored here in Qatar. This is the first side to secure a spot in the round of 16. Denmark, highly disappointing in both their games. Uh, they were just chasing here. They did manage to pull level, dreaming of a point there, only to see Kylian Mbappe just too good. Antoine Griezmann has also been incredible. He's, he's, he's been okay at club level the last couple of years, but with the national team, he's been something else. I think some people would say, is there an upgrade for Griezmann? No. Didier Deschamps knows that. He is just too good. And that's what he's going to be there. This response by the French in over two games shows you that they are uh, serious about repeating. We see these reigning champions always struggle. Uh, this has not been the key for the French national team. Maybe that hurdle awaits them in the not too distant future. I doubt it will happen against Tunisia in their final game, uh, but it doesn't matter. They should win the group. Kylian Mbappe and this French team that was uh, beaten up with injuries now, uh, striking some fear into other teams. Denmark was a, a team that I had reaching the final. If I could redo my bracket, I would. Uh, I'd almost, they may not even get out of this group. I mean, they need to play a lot better than they have in the first two, and they're going to be needing a win over Australia. They better find it. Christian Eriksen hasn't got into sync. There's a problem with the strikers. They've already gone through three or four options, and no one can score. The, the wide players, some moments, and they're giving up too many good shots. They gave up a lot to the French. So uh, Denmark, not the team that beat France twice earlier this year, nor the team that we saw in the Euros. It's just different. And that happens sometimes at a World Cup. And this Danish team, which, uh, you know, they didn't hide from the fact that they felt that they were a team could win it. Just don't look the part. Just don't look the part. They probably make the round of 16. They probably beat Australia, but it's going to be short-lived. Famous last words. Finally, Argentina, Mexico. Uh, Mexico, Argentina has been their bogey team in World Cups. They have one win in their last 18 games versus the Argentines. Argentina looks so flat. Even into this game in the first half, there was panic mode. I had never seen so many uh, histrionics from the sideline. Lionel Scaloni, there's a video of Pablo Aymar, the assistant coach, going, oh, uh, like, like they're, they're crying. Like all is lost. Argentina were on the ropes. If they had lost this game, they were out of the World Cup. Tata Martino is going to be uh, in the crosshairs here. 
fielded a very defensive side. Five defenders did not start Edson Alvarez. Edson Alvarez, in fact, didn't get into this game. You could argue Edson Alvarez is the most talented Mexican player. Hector Herrera, Andres Guardado, just really old players coming in. I will say, uh, they, Guardado played pretty well before he got injured. And Herrera was okay, but at the end, he needed to get out of there. And he was on the hook for the Lionel Messi go. Messi had disappeared. We were re- I was ready to tell you here and just grill Lionel Messi for fading in a big opportunity. But there it was. 30 yards out. Hector Herrera backs off of him. Messi hits it. Doesn't hit it all that hard. I don't think Memo Ochoa saw it. Saw it goes into the back of the net. Wasn't that well taken. It was nice for Messi, but I would imagine Messi hits those. He thinks that's going to be saved. Instead, it goes in and it changes everything. Argentina grow into the game. They brought in Julian Alvarez. They brought in uh, Enzo Perez. Those two guys were huge. Maybe they get, play a bigger role here. You look for the hot hand. And now everyone is uh, looking at Argentina to fix things and right the ship and go back to the top of Group C. I'm still a little reluctant because... Argentina, for long stretches here, looked shaky. Several players looked shaky, and that is worrisome. Um, Again, Messi did nothing with that for the longest stretch. And uh, Mexico is Tata Martino. Mistakes. He he made bad substitutions. Again, if Argentina's jury is still out, Mexico, they're not going to make the round of 16. They have to beat Saudi Arabia by a couple goals, and they hope that Argentina... Blows the doors off Poland. Or if Poland wins that game and Mexico's able to pop in front of Argentina as well. But Poland's not going to play to win against Argentina. They're going to play to tie them because they know what they need to do to get through the group. They're not going to, you know, that's not Poland. It's about getting the group. Even if they have to sacrifice winning the group, it's about making it to the round of 16. And that group is very tightly packed. So huge disappointment from the CONCACAF teams as we talked about. Uh, They're not scoring goals. Mexico has not scored a goal. Uh, This is not going to go well south of the border. We're going to preview the games for tomorrow. Before we get that, I wanted to talk about Gio Reyna a little bit. It is a story that's developing around the U.S. camp as the smoke has settled here from the USA-England game. Eric Winalda, who's been a guest on this show, did uh, have some comments, and these are not confirmed, that he's been speaking to Gio Reyna's dad, Claudio, who, and they've had conversations, they're upset about Gio not playing, that there may have been a fallout between Greg Berhalter and Gio Reyna. Again, some other people may be saying it's not confirmed. Uh, if it is something that's happening, it's par for the course, really, with the World Cup. We see this all the time. You know, players and coaches maybe not seeing eye to eye, and it's cost the player in the big picture of things. I think we saw something like that with Greg Berhalter and John Brooks, which saw his kind of demise on the national team. The question with Gio Reyna, and you could say he's one of the two or three best American players. You could argue he is the most talented American player. But the question is, where do you put him? Yes, the U.S. needs goals. They have scored one. But they're coming off a a game that they should have won against the Welsh, and they improved in that second game against England. So there are a few places you could play him. A, where Tim Way is. It doesn't quite work because Tim Way has been great and he is that guy who gets vertical and the U.S. needs that to extend the field to make space. I mean, I was watching that England game and these guys were flying. It was exciting. Play him at number nine. Hasn't really happened. That's an experiment. I don't think you do that here at the World Cup, even though we haven't had any production from Haji Wright, Josh Sargent, or Jesus Ferreira, who is not featured here, but in the World Cup buildup coming in. Do you play him in midfield? Maybe, but Weston McKinney, Eunice Musa, Tyler Adams were the stars of that England game. You don't mess with that. You want to keep that trio in place for the duration of this World Cup. Weston McKinney hadn't been 100%, but you hope he's getting closer to playing 90 minutes. You put him in for Christian Pulisic, maybe. those That's a similar position, but Christian Pulisic, unless he can't go, is going to start. So right now, Gio Reyna is a luxury player, so we can scream and yell about... Why he hasn't been used, but I ask you this, where do you play him? I will, I will argue that, and I'll win this argument every time. Gio Reyna, unfortunately, is a luxury player at this point, and we, we hope he gets his moment. If they advance to the round of 16 and beyond, then they will have that chance, I can guarantee you. He seems like a very uh, 
practical type to be in this Idan game to break down defenders, but you don't mess around with things right now. The question is maybe do you bring him in sooner than Greg Berhalter did against England? It was like the 77th minute. I like the way the U.S. was playing. I was okay with not having subs. So you leave that there. So this is going to be an issue. U.S. is going well. You want to clear the negativity. But the Gio Reyna situation, I, I understand why we're talking about it, is out there. And we got to grin and bear it. So there you go. Soccer OG World Cup Daily. We will be back. We will preview the games for Sunday, including the big one, Spain and Germany. And stick around for my interview with Eric Braden of The Young and the Restless. Before we move forward here on the Soccer OG World Cup Daily, a reminder, we are presented by Farmer John. Start your morning, whether you're getting up on the East Coast at 5 a.m. or on the West Coast at 2 a.m., maybe a little bit early, with some of their fine products, including bacon, which is such a resourceful food. I had it this morning, I kid you not. Farmer John sorting it out. Some nice smokehouse bacon, a couple fried eggs, and a nice piece of toast, and a cup of coffee. Life is good, so highly recommend it. I see some people are already getting some. Uh, you won't regret it. It's very good. Group E, Group F in uh, the crosshairs tomorrow begins bright and early with Japan, Costa Rica. Costa Rica was, uh, how do we put it, an embarrassment. 7-0 uh, loss to Spain. When you see that result, you think of a very short list of embarrassing World Cup fixtures. You think of... Brazil beating, or Germany beating Brazil 7-1, but that's a bit of an outlier. That was just a freaky game that you can't put your finger on it. Or, maybe more appropriately, because it's a CONCACAF team, Hungary beating El Salvador 10-1 in the 1982 World Cup. Saudis took a big loss, I think it was 2002 or 2006 to Germany. So this is weird to score that many goals. It just doesn't happen in the World Cup, and you've seen... The big shots in the minnows, now it's usually a goal or two in it. Very rarely does it get beyond that. Luis Fernando Suarez, the Costa Rican coach, said he will make changes to the starting 11. He says it's not about names, it's about attitudes. Obviously, you have to shake it up. Uh, even some guys you may like, you got to maybe move them out because they were shelled like that. They didn't touch the ball against Spain. The, uh, the Costa Ricans, uh, part of this World Cup effort from CONCACAF teams... I was, it's been bad. It's been weird. It's a fine line, So the, except for Costa Rica. It, it, the, you've seen bright spots from the U.S. You've seen bright spots from Canada. A couple bright spots from Mexico. But in six games played up till now, only one goal between those four teams over those six games. Some goals that need to be scored. Hopefully on uh, tomorrow by Costa Rica and Canada. Uh, Japan, as you know, I'm a big fan of. They uh, defeated Germany coming from behind. And uh, now this Japanese team has to make sure that they don't put their guard down. If they win this game, they are in. They're supposed to win this game. Uh, the sports book keeps it pretty close. And I th it's not going to be 7-0, I can tell you. It's going to be close. Costa Rica will be competitive here. They're going to like their chances against Japan. Now, if Japan... Let their foot off the, the pedal here. Uh, their spot in the next round is in major peril. Can't lose. Even a tie, depending on what happens on the later game, you got to be a little bit worried. Uh, I'm confident the Japanese won't allow that to happen. They're just way too talented. Maya Yoshida said about the spotlight is on us, and after the last game, we have to make sure we don't dance badly. Is that like a lost in translation? We don't dance badly in the Japanese translation? Hajime Moriyasu, the manager, who I thought was a rock star in the win against Germany. As I said on the show, he, in the second half with the adjustments, he, all the subs he made were good ones. It changed the game. He outsmarted, outcoached Hansi Flick, who is regarded as one of the two or three best managers in this tournament. But Moriyasu said, Japan wants to build its own style by also learning from other countries. And I'm glad he said it there because there are some teams in this competition that aren't European, but look at Europe for their lead. Japan is one. Uh, Morocco, I'll talk about them in a little bit, is another. They want to be feel like a European feel because they know it's successful. So they have a lot of players in Europe. And when you see them, it feels like they, they can 
seamlessly compete with the European clubs. Japan is one of them, very specific to the German style. Uh, they've mentioned how grateful they are to German football. So uh, the bench is in Japan's favor. This will be close, and I, I want Costa Rica to do well, but I really I don't want Japan to blow this opportunity because I think if they make the round of 16, shoot, maybe they win the group. They probably won't, but they get into the round of 16, they're going to be a very tough opponent, and they will add a lot to this tournament. Belgium, Morocco. Morocco tied Croatia, scoreless 90 minutes. Belgium beat Canada, even though Canada were just the better team. Uh, missed a penalty. Uh, Alfonso Davies, we talked about that. Uh, John Herdman allowing Alfonso Davies to take a penalty, even though um, he doesn't take him for his club. By the way, if you're a Bayern, you're way down the pecking order when it comes to taking penalties. So maybe there's nothing you could avoid with that. With Tunisia losing African hopes, the ball falls into Morocco's court. I think it's the best bet. I feel Morocco can run with Belgium based on what we saw, although Canada was a better matchup because of the way they play, because of all the attackers they can throw at a, a slower Belgian backline than what we will see with Morocco, who like to come out wide a little bit more and will be a little more conservative. Uh, it's not as good of a matchup. Uh, Canada's weird. We'll talk about them and why it's a, a, a really good addition here. Uh, these two played in 1994 World Cup, Belgium winning one zero. There is an interesting dynamic here. There's a huge contingent of Moroccans who live in Belgium. Going back, there was a, a work exchange or something. Don't hold me to it, but a lot of uh, Mo Moroccan immigration. There have been some Moroccan players uh, of Moroccan uh, lineage that have played for Belgium, most famously Maroon Fel Mar Marouane Fellaini, Marouan Fellaini uh, with the big hair. Uh, four Moroccan players were born in Belgium, so you have these connections. So this is going to be heated, especially with the fans. So keep an eye on that because maybe we don't know Belgium and Morocco have these kind of ties that bind, but they certainly do. Belgium had uh, that save by Thibaut Courtois. Michi Bashuai scored the goal. Romelu Lukaku, it looks like he's coming back soon, although Roberto Martinez said he's very good. He's ahead of where he should be, but we maybe not ready for Sunday. He also said about the Belgian effort, uh, or this is Aiden Hazard. We were better four years ago, but uh, we're still a very good team. And by the way, Kevin De Bruyne said this, and I don't know if his tongue was in cheek, but he had a, a quote, and I'm just paraphrasing here. He goes, we have no chance of winning. We are too old. I, 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 I think it's kind of like an out of hand comment to kind of quell the media. But I think he kind of knows, he says it too. I think he kind of doesn't believe it, but he thinks about it. Especially after that first performance. I mean, Belgium's ranked two in the world. How could you rank them that highly based on how we've seen them play? It's, uh, it's a conundrum. You're going to talk about teams that can win it. You throw out three or four names. Belgium's not one of them. Can it be one of those names? Sure. Especially when we see what happens in the round of 16. And if they win the group, and beating Morocco here pretty much, I think, will lock it in that they'll win the group, then they won't have to worry about second-guessing because they'll be in pretty good shape. Uh, Valid Regragawi, who uh, has been a player's manager for Morocco, Brought back Hasim Ziyech and Nusayer Mazraoui, who's not 100%. He plays at Bayern Munich. So much talent there. Ashraf Hakimi, Yassim Bono in gold. Uh, I like Morocco, but I think they just don't have enough to run with Belgium. But this is going to be a good game, so uh, certainly enjoy that. Croatia, Canada. John Herdman. You know what we like about John Herdman? He likes himself a slice of John Herdman. Likes to talk the talk, which is great at a World Cup. We like managers to stir it up because they're all so quiet and hush-hush. But as you uh, probably know, John Herdman after the Belgium game says, I told my team that they belong here. We're going to go and F Croatia. It's as simple as it gets. Threw the gauntlet down uh, at the Croatians. Croatian tabloid heard it. They responded, you have the mouth, but you don't have the balls as well. There's the headline. Ooh, and a very, uh, not a very great photo of John Herbert. Not a flattering photo of John Herbert. Looks like he needs to hit the weight room there. 
This is uh, it stirred the pot. It got back to the uh, the Croatian team as well. Zlatko Dalic says the Croatian team deserves respect from everyone, and they do. And John Herdman is towing the line here, man. This could blow up in his face. Everyone likes the the cool rah rah guy, fearless. Everyone likes it until he talks too much and can't back it up. And if they lose to Croatia, that's exactly where Canada will be. He took a swing at Croatia. Croatia was in the 2018 World Cup final. That is an elite team. So if you take a swing at them, you better connect. See if John Herbin does. You know, it's you fall on your face if you don't. But if you connect, Canada can beat Croatia and they can beat Croatia, then... Uh, then we're in business. Canadian lineup, I think, is going to be interesting. We're going to have the three defenders, three midfielders, two wingbacks in the attack. We're, uh, Alfonso Davies is there. Tejan Buchanan, who, by the way, getting uh, reports that his value from Club Bruges is now in the 20 million plus range if you want to bring him in, which is amazing because this is a guy three years ago was playing at Syracuse University. Now he's going to probably play for a top club in England or Spain. Not too bad. You, I like the late bloomers, but he had a good game and Alfonso Davies was healthy and ready to go. It's Jonathan David and maybe Kyle Lahren and somebody in CONCACAF score a goal. For goodness sakes, Jonathan David, you're the best striker we have in this region. You score a goal. We're going to have problems. Going to be a good one. It's feisty. Canada is a must watch. Uh, and it's amazing since they haven't been in the World Cup in 1986. What a difference they have been. It's going to be one in the midfield. Canada has to run there because uh, the strength of Croatia, Marcelo Brozovic, Mateo Kovacic, Luka Modric. Pressure Modric. Yeah, I don't think he was all that good in the first game. He's influential, yes, but you can un unhinge him a little bit. What, he's 37? So that's a part of it too. Time now for the main course, Spain, Germany. And that'll uh, see if Spain can build off of the victory over Costa Rica. They, uh, they win this there. And, well, we'll see what happens with the Japan game. I wanted to start this off by saying Luis Enrique has uh, this streaming service where he talks to the fans and takes their questions. He's cut out the middleman, the media. And he encourages fans to ask him questions. And one of them asked if he was okay with players having sex before the tournament. And in this World Cup, everything's heightened, but, you know, a lot of coaches say no sex during the World Cup, and everyone accepts it. He said, doesn't bother him. And kind of what behind closed doors those players should do. It's their own business. And I was like, when did we get in this thing where no sex? What kind of antiquated thing is that? I, you know, what you know about sex is, might help you clear out a few things. You either maybe have sex or you drink or you do some exercise whatever it takes to kind of get your mind off the game i mean could it really be that detrimental it's you know the release i hope i'm sorry we're getting a little too detailed here but i mean it's not like they're you know doing adult films for 24 hours straight right it's their significant other blowing off some steam so good for you luis enrique biggest ever world cup win for spain against costa rica Last time Spain and Germany played, November of 2020, in the Nations League, Spain beat Germany 6-zip. Germany has not beaten Spain in a competitive fixture since 1988. So everything is telling you that the Germans uh, are about to see their tournament end. And then I go to the sports book, and Spain is a plus 130 favorite. That's not a big favorite. So Vegas is saying, go to Germany. Why would you want? They, want? they want the money on Germany. So maybe there's something there. Uh, there's been a come to Jesus moment for a lot of the Germans. Kai Havertz had a, he's mentioned there was a bull. It wasn't, it was a Julian Brandt, big team meeting where they analyzed, quote, all the things we didn't do well. There was an exchange of views. A little early to have that meeting, quite frankly, but that's the Germans. It's desperate times for desperate measures. They are the 2014 champs. It's crazy to think Germany, we were so... Uh, accustomed to Germany or conditioned to Germany always doing well in the World Cup. 2014 champs, semifinals in 2010, semifinals in 2006, runner-up in 2002, out in the groups in 2018, potentially out of the groups in 2022 if they lose this game. 
So a lot on the line. It's going to be a fantastic game. Looking forward to seeing a lot of individual performances. Pedri, the 19-year-old. Gavi, the 18-year-old. They both started the first game. They'll both start here again. Leroy Sana's back for Germany. And uh, Jamal Musiala. Let's see what you got, buddy. Eh, had a couple glimmers in the first game. Let's see you get it going. I would... Uh, I'd be shocked if Germany doesn't have a, a real good effort here. And that means we're going to have a fantastic game to wrap up Sunday's action. And then we get into the second full week of the World Cup. We're going strong, folks. We're going to continue here on the Soccer OG World Cup Daily. Speaking of Germany, Eric Braden, born in Germany. We'll talk about Die Mannschaft and all the things that have stood out about the World Cup, including this incredible performance from Lionel Messi. Hello, Eric. Uh, great to, to be chatting with you. I know you've been um, watching these games thoroughly like I have, and we just watched Lionel Messi. We know how much pressure is on him. Your thoughts about seeing a guy like that get the goal in that huge in that huge moment? To be honest with you, it it it, it really almost moved me to tears. And it, it, he is so deserving of it. This man has given us so much joy over the years. He and, and Cristiano Ronaldo and obviously a number of other players, but Messi, most of all, unbelievable. I mean, unbelievable. I've been around soccer for 60 or 70 years now, and I've really never seen anything like it. You know, he does it with an ease. He does it and he never complains He when he gets hit and he gets hit hard all the time. You know, they're after him. I played defense for many years. We would, we would aim for guys like that, you know. <laughs> so he is he's a tough guy and what a wonderfully humble human being, you know. I want to talk to you about that because you uh, you were a, a big-time player in the Los Angeles area and this sport has changed so much. How have you seen it, not just as a, being as a player, as a spectator watching World Cup games? Um, what, what are your thoughts on the growth? Well... The, um, you know, I, I won the U.S. Championship in 1973 with the Maccabees for the first time, and they won it five times, the most of any other team. That was the anyway, U.S. Open Cup. I am so happy about how America's accepted soccer and how it has evolved here, because I remember from the very beginning, I remember the guy who started the AYSO, the American Youth Soccer Association. That was in 1964-65. Hans Fiele. I remember when he came to us on the field at Jackie Robinson Stadium and said, I'm going to start a new league called the AYSO. Both boys and girls play. We laughed at him. We said, well, good luck. Well, the rest is history. And the American team, to see them, I tell you, it, it really moves me. I mean, they are damn good. And they should have beaten England. And they should have beaten Wales. Should have won both games. It really, I, I must say, it, it touched me deeply. We just need to score goals, Eric. So I know AOSO is doing a great job. We need to get some strikers in there because I agree with you. And I was watching the England game. Well, I mean, the, but the only team, the only the only team that really scored so far has been England against Iran, and that was like picking ripe fruit, you know. <laughs> in other words, the Iranian players had anything but soccer in their mind. Sure. When their mullahs back home in Iran were going after their family, you know that they didn't think much about soccer. So I admire their comeback in the second game yesterday, you know? There's a there's a lot to unpack in this World Cup. I mean, we mentioned what's happened in Qatar and Iran. And it's, I mean, I, 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 I am enjoying the games, but I always feel like there's a burden on all of us because of what's happening in the world. Do you, do you feel that as well as, as you mentioned what happened with the Iranian players? To be honest with you, but I felt it very specifically with the Iranian players. I mean, they they must have played with a huge burden on their shoulders, you know? I mean, they're worried because you know that they'll go after their families probably, most likely. Yeah. So that was a demonstration against the regime and hopefully not suffering terrible consequences. Um, the other stories involving Qatar, well, you know, once you accept going there, just accept their rules and regulations, you know, to help with it. I mean, yeah. That's my opinion. Yeah. Sports is one thing. Look, 
Olympics and soccer tournaments and tennis and all international sports have been held in countries that have not been known for their democratic values. So let's not bush it, okay? <laughs> but I, you said it right there. Once you agree to coming, so if there was going to be an issue, you have yes. to agree. And there's a lot of complaining going on, and I get it, and I've complained. But once you've agreed to it, it's too late now. Look, as long as you have a governing body of FIFA with all white vests on, they all have white shirts on, they're as innocent as, you know, as choir boys. <laughs> when, they, when they gave their work up to Qatar, you, and first to Putin and then to Qatar, you knew, you knew <laughs> some Swiss bank accounts were getting bigger and bigger. And, and, and now Johnny Infantino is mentioning North Korea in 2030. So, <laughs> I mean, who knows, who knows what's next? I don't know how you can talk yes. that. Uh, your rooting interests are with Germany. We know that uh, a tough one against Japan. I thought the Japanese were inspiring. Big game coming up against Spain. I think that's one of the big games in the groups. Uh, your uh, your hopes for this German team from one game to the next? Well, I obviously hope that they will win, but that is a that's a tall task to be honest with you. Yeah, you know Germany doesn't have a bona fide striker, and uh, but I think as a team they play damn well. They have almost dominated every game they've played it but they can't finish. And the Japanese threw everything, all their sushi, all their kitchen sinks, they threw at Germany. <laughs> we couldn't penetrate that. Yeah. That goalkeeper played the game of his life. You know that. Yeah. And they're very tenacious. They are very quick. They're difficult to get through in the defense. You know, smaller teams are very difficult to penetrate in, in the 16-yard area. Very difficult because they're quick and they change direction quickly. So Germany did not use its height in the corner balls or set pieces. So it's tough, you know. Um, and I think what we see in this World Cup is that the gap between the developed soccer nations and those who have come to it more lately is closing. Really, it's closing. <laughs> That's a good I mean, thing. Saudi, it's Arabia, World Cup. Saudi Arabia played pretty damn well. All the African nations play well. Uh, Algeria already gave gave Germany troubles in, in 214 in, in Brazil. Made the round of 16. Yeah. Morocco is very good. Tunisia is good. They all get they're getting tough. And the Asians, the uh, South Koreans, and the Japanese are damn good. And very we, tough. Who, who of everyone you've seen, who's the who's the team that you think is a number one, the team I think, to beat. I think, to be honest with you, it has to be Brazil. Yeah. Brazil this year is, they have a new coach, that old guy, that old disciplinarian, that sergeant, you know, Scolari, whatever the hell his name is. He <laughs> was bad Phil, for them. Big Phil Scolari, Ima yes. Imagine, imagine, imagine being Neymar, and you have this old disciplinarian there. <laughs> That's a different world, you it know. He says, to hell with you. Um, so they all rebelled against that, plus the expectation on their shoulders were enormous. But Germany, we beat them, what, 6-1, 7-1 in the final? Oh, Sem boy. Semi-final, yeah, I know. That was uh, unbelievable. <laughs> Seven that's goals! Gonna be, that's going to be a nightmare to stay with Brazilians for many I years. know. That's <laughs> a, well, that's the problem with Brazil. Those big quarterfinal semifinals, they'll run into a Germany or a Belgium, which they did last time, and it falls apart. Eric, en enjoy the games. Get your sleep like I will. I've been struggling with that, but uh, I know you're all in and uh, enjoy this the next couple of weeks. Well, I'm going to catch up on my sleep. I'm going to watch a golf tournament, okay? <laughs> it's like Ambien. TV Be Ambien. Cool, okay. Eric, right Eric Braden joining me. Make sure you join at the Soccer OG World Cup Daily. We'll be back tomorrow. We'll, we'll talk about that Germany oh, and boy. Spain game. Yes. Oh, yeah. See you then.